Today is the 2nd of April, a very important day for me. We call it the Bandara, Great Master's Bandara. Bandar means abundance. Bandara means the celebration of abundance. On this day, especially on this day, there is abundance of grace that I haven't seen on any other day in any of the years since 1948 when Great Master left his physical body but remained a permanent companion to all his disciples in his radiant astral form. This has been a great day. This is one of the days that I see that whoever has assembled for this celebration gets abundance of grace. You will notice that today also. This is not a day when I am going to teach you anything, nor share any teaching. We'll have the next two days, Saturday or Sunday for that purpose. Today we just celebrate. We celebrate that such a man walked upon this earth who could alter the lives of so many people in such a significant way. And the great master, I call him the greatest because for me, you are the greatest. It does not mean that you should all call him the greatest master. You call your own master. The master who has given you initiation, helped you discover the spiritual path within yourself, they are the greatest for you. For me, Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh, the greatest master, is the greatest master. Because he has totally transformed me, totally changed from what I was to what I am today. And that one man can do this is an amazing miracle. I celebrate this day for myself. Somebody told me once that on this Bandara, nobody will turn up. He said, we don't, I don't need anybody to turn up. Two people will be there, I and the great master. And that's all that's needed for Bandara. If other people join in, they're lucky. They're just fortunate to enjoy the abundance of the grace that comes. We used to have the Bandara in Great Master's Dera in India on the 29th of December every year. That was the day when Great Master's own master, Baba Jamal Singh, passed away in his physical body. And Great Master used to celebrate the day with so much affection. He showed how much affection he had for his master. He showed that this was a true spiritual path where you and the master are the only participants. It's not a community effort. It's not something in which the whole public has to join. It is something between the individual seeker of the truth and his master. Sometimes people think that the master means the man who walks outside and talks to you and initiates you, gives you directions what to do, tells you about the spiritual path, tells you what books to read, that's unimportant. The real master is within ourselves. The real master is our own real self. Our own highest state of consciousness is the real master. We don't know who we are. We totally forgotten who we really are. We are so much out in this world, our attention has gone out so much into this world that we never look inside to see who are we really. The greatest of philosophers have said that true realization is self-realization. If we can know who we are, who the self is, we will have discovered the true master also. Since we do not know who we are and we hear people telling us, teachers telling us, books telling us, that the truth lies inside us and has always been inside us. We try to go inside, have a look inside. We close our eyes and see nothing but darkness. So we think there's nothing inside. So we open our eyes and look at the world which is lighted up outside and look for a master outside. What can the true master do if this is our state of affairs? If we are constantly looking outside for a master, the true master who is actually inside us must jump out and become a human being outside. That's exactly what happens. So the master that we see outside as a human being is truly a personification in human form of the truth 
of totality of consciousness that lies inside us. When we realize who we are, we will also discover that the true master was always inside us, never outside. The outside form is very good, it's very useful. We celebrate, I am celebrating today the mandara of great master because it was the outside form of that man that was able to show me the true master inside. If the outside form had not come into my life, I would have known nothing about the true master inside. I am making this point because sometimes people feel that if we and our totality, our creator, our God, whatever name you give it, is a direct connection between us, why do we need a third party intervention? Why do we need an agent to discover our own reality? Why do we need a master at all? If the truth is lying inside, why can't we just find it? The reason is simple. That over the course of several births and rebirths and the course of a long journey in existence in this physical plane, we have lost touch with our own self. And the master comes as a personification outside to tell us that you can find the truth again inside. A true master will never say, follow something outside. He takes us away from these rituals, from superstitions. He takes us away from following blindly things outside of ourselves and directs us to discover the truth within. That's the beauty, that here is somebody outside of us who is really existing and speaking to us from inside. Once we discover this truth, then we discover that a master in an outward bodily form, in a physical form, is a temporary association that our body is a temporary form out here, doesn't live too long, 50, 60, 100, 120 years. People don't live longer than that in this physical body. You couldn't be calling this body anything similar to the soul which is immortal. The master that we see in a physical body outside also lives just the same age, dies like us. He lives like us. He's so ordinary like us. Therefore, the master outside is a short-lived experience, like our body here is a short-lived experience. But the reality of the master inside and our own reality is permanent, is immortal. And we discover the immortality of our soul while we are still in the body with the help of somebody who has come outside as an ordinary human being. The beauty of a relationship between a disciple and a master is that the master is able to guide us in this world, starting from the point where we are. We are in the physical body, taking this physical body to be a reality. We are in this physical world and we take the physical world to be the only reality. We don't experience any other reality. Therefore, the master in the physical body becomes the only real master. He starts from there and he says, this is real. The world is real, come to a bandara, come to an initiation, come to a meditation session and start from here. He doesn't say this is all an illusion, he doesn't say this is unreal, because we take it as real, so he starts with where we are and says, okay, let's start with this reality, let's work from here and we go up from here and find out the truth of how real it is or unreal it is. More than a hundred years ago, a Swami came from India to this country. His name was Vivekananda. And he spoke in the World Congress of Religions in Chicago. He was found accidentally by an American lady waiting outside his, her house. But when he spoke, people were very impressed because he spoke about the truth inside. In two or three days of that session, he told the congregation that this world is illusion. This world is not what it appears to be. It is not real. We are making it up. And we are making it up to make up a reality. And on the third day, he said, all these days I have been telling you this world is unreal. If that is so, I must be also unreal. 
how come i am telling you this world is unreal and i an unreal person is talking to unreal people what am i trying to drive and he answered his own question he said because we take this real, unreal world as the only reality and you taking me as your only reality i am speaking to you in this so called reality to bring you to true reality all other things that you come across draws you out and makes this reality permanent for you whereas by talking to you i am telling you this is unreal and you can go inside and find reality it's like waking up if a person is sleeping and having a dream the dream looks real at that time the dream is so real that even if a second person is sitting next to the person who is sleeping and trying to wake up that person the person who is dreaming is still in the state where the dream is more real than the voice of the person trying to wake him up supposing a person is dreaming as he is carrying his horses to his farm i'm taking an example he is holding his horses carrying them in this dream he lying in bed the man who is trying to wake him up nudges him and says get up get up he says what about my horses the man who is awake he says don't worry i'll hold your horses and he wakes up the man when the man wakes up he doesn't say where are my horses nor does he say you told me a lie that you would hold my horses because by waking up he realizes that the intention of the person to wake him up was to wake him up and not to hold the horses which were not real anyway but they were real for the dream when these perfect living masters come into our life they are like awakened beings and we are sleeping and dreaming we have made our dream world into a reality they nudge us and said wake up and we talk to them about our problems of this world they say okay we'll take care of them and they intervene in this life knowing very well that when we awake to a higher level of consciousness we will discover those problems had no value at all because they were made up by our mind i went to school in a very good university in this country harvard university in cambridge massachusetts and the professors there had done a lot of research on the psychological content of the so called spiritual experiences they questioned me every day we had some discussion or the other they questioned me whether i was not making up all this stuff that i was talking of a higher level of consciousness i was talking of a spiritual journey where one could travel to another area of experience a different world i could travel to a world where time was different than here that there was timelessness in a certain state of consciousness that wasn't i making up all the stuff and i said yes i could be i couldn't deny that i said most likely you are right i am making it up but i am also making up what you are seeing now and just so are you making it up if you can convince me that you are not making up what you call reality physical reality i will tell you that i am not making up something else we are all making up something it's all being projected from the mind the whole of creation is being projected from the mind as we awake from one state to another we discover that the lower state of consciousness was made up like a dream it's like a series of awakenings that people say there are several levels of consciousness it only means that we can awake several times and find that there is a higher reality what is real is only relative is relative to another state which does not appear to be real a dream is real while we are dreaming and becomes unreal when we are awake similarly this wakeful state becomes a dream when we awake to higher level of consciousness but remains a reality till then when masters come into our life they guide us they also know that in our consciousness we have been endowed with a wonderful equipment called the human mind it's such a wonderful thing it's a machine that thinks we have been given this wonderful machine to think to think when we want 
to think what we want, to use it as a very sophisticated, elegant computer. It works so well. Whatever we want to make use of it, we communicate. I am talking to you using the mind. I am listening to you using the mind. I communicate using the mind. I have to think out a problem, use the mind. We have been given this wonderful equipment to use. And this is even more important than the physical body we have. The physical body itself is a miracle. The amount of information, the amount of uh, material that it contains, the treasure it contains. But the mind is even more beautiful. It's such a wonderful thing. But what have we done? Over the ages, we have started treating the mind not as a machine, not as an equipment that was given to us to use. We have started using the mind as it is ourself. We have begun to identify ourselves with the mind. We have forgotten that we are not the mind. We are consciousness per se. We are the soul, the spirit. And the mind was given to us to use. We become the mind itself. So we have allowed the mind a free right to think whatever it likes and to guide us through its free thinking and arbitrary thinking. During tomorrow's workshop, those of you who are staying on for tomorrow's workshop, we'll examine the nature of the mind and how the mind, which is supposed to be a slave of ours, a mind that was supposed to be the best equipment we could use in all ways, including spiritual path, has become our master and is telling us what to do. The mind is making decisions for us. Do you know what a sad day it will be when computers tell us what to do instead of our telling computers what program to run? We are doing that already with the built-in computer, which is our mind inside the head. The mind is a wonderful thing to think, to analyze, to put sensory perceptions together, to make sense of it, to create a whole world, to create whatever you like. Such a powerful thing. And then we should use this mind just to tell us what to do. The mind can be very erratic. The mind works on memories. The mind works on reassembling memories. It works through a process which is terrible if you allow it free play. The process is called doubt. The mind is capable of creating doubt. It's a natural tendency it has. It was supposed to be a caution, a warning. It was supposed to be a way in which the mind could warn you of certain events that may happen which you can avoid. It was supposed to be an alarm for you. Therefore, it creates doubt which was supposed to be healthy skepticism. Healthy doubt so that you don't go after blind faith, don't go blindly after anything. But what are we doing with that skepticism? We're doubting everything. Doubt has become a way of life. Because we listen to the mind as if the mind is the master. And from doubt follows the second deadly thing, which is fear. Doubt and fear pervade in our lives because we became subject to the laws of the mind rather than the laws of the spirit. The laws of the spirit were very different all the time. Great master explained that the soul is our reality. The spirit, consciousness is our reality, not the thinking process. The thinking process is must a process, just a process which we use in time and space, in cause and effect. The mind is a great machine to create experience and put it into this format, the format of time, space and cause and effect. That's all. Without the mind, we won't have it. Without the mind, we don't experience these things. The mind creates beginnings, middle and end. The mind creates here and there, now and then. And then the mind also is able to perceive experience through this format. And because it creates time and space and causes here and there to take place and now and then, it also introduces the law of cause and effect. This is the beauty of the mind that it can say everything that happens must have a cause. But it's beautiful that the mind should create this setup by which everything has a cause and the cause has an effect. What is the implication of this? The implication is so long as we have a mind, we have a great law 
called the law of karma. What is karma? Karma is nothing else except cause and effect. Karma means what you do now. You pay for it or get rewarded for it. Do what your mind says is wrong and you will be punished. Do what your mind says is right and you will be rewarded. And you will be rewarded in time and space. Cause and effect has been placed into time and space. So, so long as you have enough causes to have effects, you are trapped here forever. A mind that was given to us to use and to be healthy, computer-like device, is holding us down by creating the law of karma, by keeping us down here in karma, and we can never get out of it till we have been rewarded or punished for what we have done. The other problem is, very big problem is, that you cannot cancel one from the other. The law of the mind does not allow that if you do one bad thing, you can do another good thing and cancel the first bad thing. You do one good thing and one bad thing, you'll be rewarded for the good thing and punished for the bad thing. People who have experience of after death, what happens to us? Those who believe that there is a hell and a heaven, and good deeds take you to heaven and bad deeds take you to hell. Question, ask them their experiences. If you have done good deeds and bad deeds, and most of us do both, you find that after death you go to both places, one after the other. Nothing cancels each other. If it could cancel, we could escape from here. We could atone all our sins and walk out. But the functioning of the mind is such that it allows you to stay on here whether you do good or bad. It's like being in a prison house where you can be an A-class prisoner, you're getting more facilities or you are a, a third rate prisoner, you put to hard labor and so on. But you're still in the prison. You never escape from the prison. The law of karma, which follows from the law of the mind, holds us here forever. Here's a great master coming and telling us, this is all made up by the mind. You are not the mind. You are the soul, the spirit that was given a mind. How come you identify yourself with the mind and get into the law of karma? Karma does not affect the spirit. You are not bound by any karma if you realize who you are. Karma is a game of the mind. Therefore, transcend the mind. Go beyond the mind. Great Master said his spiritual path started from when the soul ascends above the mind and goes to its true home into totality of consciousness. His path was not here from physical plane to the causal plane to the universal mind. He said this path starts from beyond that. There are so many teachers in this world, so many spiritual teachers. A guru's galore. Great Master used to say in India there are more gurus than disciples. And I find now, a lot of them come to this country. It's a great business. It's a great business to be a guru these days. So the gurus are going around all over telling the same thing. That do meditation, you go from here to there. Hardly any one of them has ever said that you have to go beyond your mind. They even equate the universal mind with your own universal totality of consciousness. Whereas the mind is actually the only barrier that we have to cross for the spiritual path. Therefore, the great master said that the true perfect living masters, perfect living masters in the sense who have transcended the mind and worked from beyond the mind, are very few in this world. They can be counted on the figures of the hand. That be so few in this whole world. But the true seekers who seek in their hearts to get out of this mess of karma. Those who want to get out of the messy life they have led because of the law of karma, they will find a true master. It's not that you can search for a master. There's no way you can search for a master and find one. If you could, if you could know who is a master, you don't need one. Then you are a master. You can't recognize a master. How do you recognize a master? A master comes in a human form entirely like us, sometimes more ordinary than us. He worked with each individual disciple at his or her level. He becomes like that individual and works from there because he works from our level. He becomes like a physical friend to us at this level. 
as we ascend into the spiritual journey, he ascends with us at the same level as we are. If we are dealing with the mind, he deals with the mind. If we are dealing with our sensory perceptions, he deals with them. If we are dealing with the physical body, he deals with us. So the master comes down to our level. He's so ordinary. Why is he ordinary? Why doesn't he show something extraordinary? I'll tell you now the real reason why a master is so ordinary. A master is so ordinary because the master knows the true path to spiritual achievement beyond the mind lies in love and devotion. Love and devotion are not a mental process. Love and devotion are directly an experience of the spirit, of the soul. Therefore, the true method, the spiritual path that we talk of, which great master teaches, is the path of love and devotion alone. Everything else is purely a game to take us from here to the point where the spiritual journey begins beyond the mind. All other things are mental. He said, let's do meditation. Why? Because we are still in the body. We still have our mind. Our mind needs conviction. We won't move on unless we cross these stages. There was a disciple of great master uh, who used to be a friend of mine in New Delhi, in India. We used to have a morning walk together. One day while walking, he said, a friend of his told him that in the initiation he had got from the master, he had been given five words and three of those words relate to the physical, astral and causal plane. And they are not the spiritual path. The spiritual path starts only from the fourth and fifth region. So why is he wasting his time repeating five words? He has started repeating only two words. So he's given up the first three because they represent the negative power up to the mind. And he said, what do you think about it? I said, I have a difficulty because the great master told me to repeat five words. I have to go back to him and check what happens if you repeat only two words. So I checked up. And the master gave a very simple example. He says, if you have a ladder to climb up, and you say you want to go to the roof, and the five steps in the ladder, will you only go on the two top steps or you will start from the bottom? You have to start from where you are. And that's why we have the five words. That made sense to me. And after that made sense to my friend also. Masters teach us a method of spiritual enlightenment. A spiritual judgment. Which starts from exactly where we are now. And take us step by step. Darja by darja. Stage by stage. And they are with us exactly in that form. In which we are at that time. Because love and devotion is not possible unless you have unconditional love that you can experience. I must confess, I'll be 84 years old this November, this year. I spent plenty of time in this physical body. And I have known the great master when I was 29 days old. So you can imagine my whole life was spent knowing this man. And some people think that because of this long association, I have been brainwashed. Somebody asked me the other day, are you brainwashed? I said, I have been brain laundered and dry cleaned thoroughly. <laughs> and I am so happy for it. <coughs> the point simple is that having seen that the starting point is from here, we go from the physical to the astral to the causal and go to this journey stage by stage, step by step. The masters teach us like that. They tell us to do meditation with the body, with the mind, with sensory perceptions. They teach us how to go from step to step because that's where we are. It does not mean this is the spiritual path. In fact, the great master said openly, meditation does not take you to the spiritual heights. Love and devotion takes you there. He said meditation is like a thermometer. A thermometer does not give you fever, it measures the fever. You put the thermometer in your mouth, it measures how much fever you have. The thermometer is not going to give you the fever. Fever comes from somewhere else. He says love and devotion creates the kind of spiritual progress that you want. 
The spiritual progress is created by the love and devotion. When you meditate, you find out where you have gone, how far you have gone. Meditation is a measure of how far you have gone. But since the mind wants more meditation and does not know what is love and devotion, therefore we start with meditation. But don't, I am not ruling out the need for meditation. We need it because we are here. But remember that meditation without love and devotion will lead you nowhere. There was a colleague of mine. Some people who had been to India with me have met that colleague. He was an initiate, great master. And I went to his house one day. There was a satsang going on, a discourse going on. And he happened to ask me, he says, you and I have both been initiated by the same master, great master. You seem to be so full of that great master has given you everything and all that. And I have been meditating regularly, two and a half hours have been a strict vegetarian, no meat, no eggs, no alcohol, no drugs, no immoral life, no womanizing, none of that stuff. And yet I have got nothing. I meditate regularly and with all my force and attention. How come I got nothing? I have been meditating for 40 years. It shocked me. But here's my colleague, my brother, initiated by the same master, great master. He's been doing the right things for 40 years. And why hasn't he got anything? So many people I've seen who on the day of meditation jumped up with joy when they saw the light inside. I saw people, the mastanas, the intoxicated ones in the discourses there would start shouting in the middle of the satsang with all that they were able to see. Here's a man who followed the instruction for 40 years and has got nothing. He said, can you tell me what happened? I said, why are you asking me? You should ask the masters. He said, I asked some other masters. They laughed at me and they just smiled. I said, why do you ask me? He said, because I notice you answer other people's questions. Even in the presence of these masters, they say, ask him and you give answers to them. That's why I'm asking you. I said, I don't give any answers. I myself have to consult the great master all the time in every question. So give me some time to consult great master on this big issue that you have raised. He said, okay, consult and tell me. I said, it takes me six months. <laughs> Actually, I was joking, but I took six months anyway. <laughs> I said, I'll see you in six months and give you an answer. After six months, I told him, you have been doing your meditation totally mechanically thinking it's a mechanical process. It is like the Hatha yogis. The yogis who say, no matter what, we will sit in this position, in this posture, this asana. We will sit in the mountain top like this for so long till we get reality. The Hatha yoga, the yoga of stubbornness. You are doing your meditation with stubbornness, thinking that the physical sitting and closing eyes and doing the repeating like a parrot is going to get you anywhere. Such a meditation takes you nowhere. You're a clear example of that. Meditation without love and devotion has no value. You must meditate with love and devotion. But how can you have love and devotion if you have no one to love and devote to? That's why the importance of a living person Otherwise, you could always say the master is my own self, master is my own highest and conscious self. I don't need anybody. But you can't have the experience of love and devotion in the physical plane, in the physical body, without another physical person. Well, there are a lot of physical persons available and we all think we have real, true love for them. But you know what kind of love we have here? Attachment is called love. That is not love. Attachment is an ego game. I love you, do you love me? And if you say yes, oh, I'm so happy I'm in heaven. If you say no, then I hate you too. What kind of this, what have you done for me lately that I should love you? That kind of love is not love. Only that love which is unconditional can be called true love. I have found the experience that a great master's love, a perfect living master's love is the only unconditional love I have found. There are people who have unconditional love. I would call them Gurmukhs, the followers of the masters who have that unconditional love in them. 
what is the unconditional love they do not judge you they are non judgmental when you judge people how can you have unconditional love to be non judgmental totally non judgmental is the first condition of love these masters they show love for you in a way nobody can because they love you whether you love them or not they love you even if you hate them they love you even if you kill them what kind of love is that that's unconditional love i find that the perfect living masters exhibit that kind of love if you have a relationship with a perfect living master of that kind you have the right object for love and devotion in your meditation you can then put that master in your imagination in your head and meditate with that love and devotion for such a master and see how meditation works so fast that's the secret the secret is not how long you sit the secret is not how long and in what sturdy position you do meditation the secret is with how much love and devotion you are doing your meditation and that is why the great master said love and devotion is the secret he told the story of his own master whose name was baba jamal singh baba jamal singh was a disciple of the another great master who lived in agra with the taj mahal is that city and he he called him swami ji said so shiv dayal singh but he was known popularly as swami ji swami ji lived in agra and baba jamal singh great master's master was initiated by swami ji one day he was in punjab living a long distance away about 300 miles away from where his master lived in those days transportation was difficult even the mail was snail mail true snail mail travel so slow <laughs> one day this baba jabal singh felt so much longing to see his master his heart was aching inside i must see my master i am missing him so much so he wrote a letter to his master beloved master i am missing you there is so much happening in my heart that i want to see you immediately i don't know what's going on but i really miss you i want to see you and he mailed that letter after about a month his reply comes to him from the master swami ji he says my beloved son jamal singh i have received your letter i am very happy to know that your soul is roaming around in the higher regions jamal singh was surprised he said my soul is going nowhere this must be a letter meant for somebody else maybe it's been addressed to me by mistake so he wrote a second letter he says beloved swami ji master my soul doesn't go anywhere i am just missing you i want to see you the feeling of wanting to see you is so strong please give me permission to come and have your darshan to see you after a month another letter comes i am very happy baba jamal singh he is called babu jamal singh i am very happy babu jamal singh that your soul is moving in the higher regions and so far as coming to see me is concerned come in the first week of next month still puzzled by these letters baba jamal singh traveled to agra and met his master and brought those two letters there the master you wrote these letters to me they are not meant for me my soul went nowhere you are writing to me that your soul is going into higher regions this must be for somebody else and swami ji laughed he said let's go and meditate for 15 minutes inside my chamber there were 10 or 15 people sitting outside yeah, in the sun they were all sitting outside so he took jamal singh inside his room and he meditated for 10 or 15 minutes and they came out he said now jamal singh tell me when i wrote those letters was your soul roaming around in the higher regions or not he said yes master it was I am not asking you if your soul was roaming around in the higher regions in this meditation 10 minutes ago I am asking you was your soul going into higher regions when I wrote those letters to you said, yes master it was going there then addressing the other 10 or 15 people swami ji said if the soul is not going into any higher regions you can never have that feeling of missing your master you can never have the feeling of that love and devotion for your master it's a sign 
that uh, your spirit is ascending in those regions, but you don't see it. Your mirth and your soul do not travel the same pace as your soul does. Mirth is the power of seeing. Soul is the power of listening. You may be still listening and seeing things here, but the feeling that comes so strong are coming because of the ascent of your soul. When you go later on to that region, you discover you were there earlier. But you were there exactly when you had that feeling of love and devotion for your master. Therefore, it's love and devotion. The whole secret of the spiritual path is love and devotion. This master, great master, whose abundance we celebrate today, he taught so many lessons in such simple ways. And we knew that it is only love that comes from the master because he can give unconditional love. We don't know how to give unconditional love. If we start thinking about it, it's no longer love, it's a mental exercise. How do we love a master? We cannot love a master because the master is coming from this region of the spirit and we are thinking about it and making it a mental exercise. All we can do is, when we experience the love of the master, which we do experience, we can respond to it by devotion. That's why the term love and devotion are put together always. We experience the love of the master and we are devoted to him. And that's our response. And love and devotion becomes one experience for the master and the disciple. This is the whole crux of the teaching. The great master. Great master did not judge people. One day, a man came and he was sitting reading his mail. The great master was sitting in an easy chair reading his mail and his secretaries, two or three secretaries who used to help him with mail in English and mail in Punjabi and Hindi, they were sitting next to him and many of us were sitting on the floor, including me and a little child at that time. I was sitting watching the great masters. I love to watch him because he's such a beautiful white beard. We love his beard. I love this guy David here because he's such a beautiful beard. You know? I, I have become I'm impartial to white beards. Anyway, we were sitting there and a man comes running and says, Master, forgive me. You told me not to drink, not to eat meat, not to do other bad things. I did everything bad last night. I was in bad company and I drank liquor. I ate steaks and meat and I Womanized and I did everything wrong last night. Please forgive me. The great master looked at him. He says, don't do it again. You are forgiven. Go. He said, thank you. Thank you, master. And ran away. That surprised the secretary sitting there. He said, master, what have you done? The man does everything wrong. You told him not to do these things. And he did everything wrong. And he just says, forgive me and you forgive him. He said, yes, poor fellow has punished himself with his mind already. He's punished enough. Why should I not forgive him? Then they said, Master, supposing he does the same things again and comes to you, will you forgive him again? Great Master said, yes, I'll forgive him again. Said, supposing he doesn't ask for forgiveness, will you still forgive him, Master? He said, I think I will still forgive him. The secretary said, Master, when will you punish him? He says, look, the whole world punishes people. The mind punishes people. The whole world is based on punishment. Why do you want me to be on the side of punishers? There are too many punishers already. Let me be on the side of the forgivers. I will always forgive. Such an important lesson. These masters are symbols of forgiveness. They always forgive. It's amazing to see how they live and how their forgiveness is shown in everything that they do. Forgiveness is essential part of true love. The master once said that if one does not have compassion and forgiveness, one should question one's love. If you say, oh, I love so much, I love so much, and they can't forgive. I think that was too bad. I can't forgive that part. Forget about your love also at that time. Love and forgiveness and compassion go together, all of them. Therefore, great master would take decisions based upon the individual but always forgive. 
also he was not giving a lecture from a book to all the people here is a spiritual teaching and I am going to teach you this and you follow it and you will be okay his method was individual customized for each individual if a master is a perfect living master he will always have a customized program for each one of his disciples otherwise there are thousands of teachers who are teaching from books who have learned everything but the teaching from the books is not spiritual knowledge that's learning there's a difference between learning and spiritual knowledge the classic case is the case of king janak in india that famous king who was a great seeker of truth and he wanted to find real knowledge so he asked his ministers and his secretaries i want to have real knowledge true knowledge where can i find it the secretaries and ministers said king you are very lucky you are born in this country this country is full of very learned people there are so many yogis and swamis and gurus you just hold a feast hold a big yagya or a feast and they love the feast especially if the food is good so you invite them and they'll come and you can get all the teaching that you want about true knowledge so the king held a big feast in his palace and all the swamis and gurus and teachers were invited and they came and they fed themselves with the feast and they sat in little groups amongst their small followers that sat around them and the king disguised himself incognito he pretended to be just a tourist and he walked amongst them listening to them and trying to find out where he can get true knowledge he was shocked to find that those people were only repeating what was in the books they were very learned people they could repeat all scriptures by heart but they had no true knowledge because they were so angry if two people disagreed they would come to blows if necessary he said what kind of knowledge is that that they are only learned people full of ego how much they have learned how many books they have read they don't have any true knowledge the king was totally disappointed and he went back to the palace and he told his uh, his secretaries and his ministers i am very disappointed i could not find true knowledge from these people they are learned people they have read too many books but they have no real experience of knowledge i want real knowledge i want true knowledge i want instant knowledge you know when he said instant knowledge what occurs to me he must have been an american in his past life <laughs> instant knowledge instant knowledge he said i want instant knowledge the secretary said king if you want that kind of knowledge this was a very short festival you had one day have a one week long and we'll by beat of drum inform all the learned people all the yogis and swamis and all the gurus of the country and they'll all assemble and let them stay for a week in your lawns big in your yard and then pitch up pitch up tents for them they'll stay here and you can get true knowledge so a bigger feast to other age for seven days this thing happened the same thing was repeated the king in this guys in cognito walked all over and he saw the same thing repeated more learned people more book knowledge more repetition and quotation more misquotation more fight over who's quoting correctly whose scripture was better than the other who had a right book or the wrong book same disputes going on same fight and argument the king was thoroughly disappointed and he came back and he said these people surely have lot of learning i don't want learning i want knowledge knowledge which is true who are we what are we here for what's the purpose of life i want to know the real thing what's going on here then his secretary said king if you want that kind of knowledge then the true master who can give you that knowledge will not come to your feast you go to him and he sits on the bank of a river his name is ashtabakar ashtabakar ashtam is eight bakar means layers actually he was a hump hunch back and he had eight layers eight waves on his back so he walked with little hunched like this so that was ashtabakar they called him ashtabakar for that reason and he was a master who lived on the bank of a river 
The king said, why didn't you tell me first? I would have gone to him straight away. So he went straight to Ashtabhaka. And Ashtabhaka said, King, how you come to my heart, little heart? He said, I have come for true knowledge. I want to invite you to come to my palace and give true knowledge. Ashtabhaka said, King, you have come with so much humility. I will certainly come to your palace and give you true knowledge. So on the appointed day, the king gathered all his relatives, noblemen, neighboring kings, all of them assembled his auditorium and the palace was full of people. And the king placed two chairs on the dais, one for himself, one for the master. And when the master came accompanied by five or six or seven of his own disciples, they took their shoes off near the door. That was the custom. They took their shoes off and the master slowly walked towards the stage. And the people saw that hunchback guy deformed body and they began to murmur and laugh. What has happened to the king? He's called all of us to get instructions on true knowledge and this is the man he has called for giving us true knowledge. So they were murmuring and laughing and giggling. When the master reached the stage, the king got up and made him sit on the next chair and he said, Master, I want true knowledge, instant knowledge. Ashtabhakar said, King, what is the price of leather today? He said, Master, I don't understand your question. I wanted true knowledge. What has leather to do with it? He says, aren't these all leather merchants here you gathered? No, Master, these are all nobility, royalty. They are all kings and princes and princesses and they have come from royal just to listen to you giving a discourse on true knowledge. He says, oh, the way they look at the skin of my body, I thought they might be interested in leather. <laughs> then the audience realized that he has some sense of humor too, which incidentally I might tell you, all perfect living masters have a great sense of humor. I have noticed that. Then the king said, okay master, give me instant knowledge. And the master said, instant knowledge? How much is an instant? Instant is also some time. How much is an instant? And the king said, an instant is when I go out horse riding in the morning, from the time I put my foot in the stirrup and jump on the saddle, that's an instant. He said, okay, I promise to give you instant knowledge. But you have to pay a price for it. The king said, any price. I am so keen to have this instant knowledge. You just quote any price. All my coffers are full of treasury, of money, whatever you want, I'll give you for this instant knowledge. Ashtar Bakar said, I want only three things. Master, you can have ten if you want. No, three will do. Give me three things and I'll give you instant knowledge. Give me your body. Give me your wealth. Give me your mind. When you've given me these three, I will give you instant knowledge. It was a very stra strange price tag, I must say. But the king was surprised, but he was so keen. He said, Master, my body is yours. All my wealth is yours. And my mind is also yours. Now give me instant knowledge. He says, are you sure you've given me all these three? Yes, master. Okay, if this body is no longer yours, it's mine. I can place it wherever I like. Go walk to the shoes I left on the door and put this body of yours on those shoes and sit down on those shoes. It's an odd command, trying to get instant knowledge and being told to sit on the shoes. But the king said, I've given my body to you, so I must go. So he got up and walked towards the door. And then the audience was really giggling and saying, this king has gone off his head and he's gone mad and crazy. This is how he's going to get instant knowledge. So as they were laughing, the king thought to himself, these people think I am the king with all the wealth and so on. And what am I doing? And he's following instructions of this guru like that. When he thought like that, Ashtabhakar shouted from the stage, King, you have no business to think of your wealth. You already given it to me. It's no longer yours. He said, oh my God, I forgot. It's not my wealth anymore. I have given it. Ashtabhakar shouted, King, you have no business to think what you've given or not given. You've given your mind also to me. Can't even think. Mind is also his. So he held his head up like this. And for a moment, there's so much stillness. 
because he realized that there was no mind for this. We gave it to the master. And at that time, enlightenment came to him. And the Ashtabhaka said, King, you don't have to go to the shoots, come back. And the king walked back to the stage. And he said, did you get instant knowledge? Yes, master. Did it take an instant or more than that? Master took less than an instant to get that knowledge. Okay, this was just a sampling. I gave you just a sample of the true knowledge. Now do meditation under my direction. For 20 years, you will get this knowledge again. <laughs> Master, thank you very much. King Janak got his, he became a mystic himself. Maybe years. But King Janak got his knowledge in that, in that way because he was willing to give these three a surrender. Great master said, the true surrender is what takes us away from our own mental grip upon ourselves. The true surrender is that we should give everything up to the master, not think it's, it's ours. Ashtabhaka told king after all this, king, I don't want your body, your mind or your wealth. I have plenty of my own problems. Take your body back. Take your wealth back. Take your mind back. But use them. Use your body. Use your wealth. Use your mind as if they still belong to Ashtabhaka. That's the secret. That the, the masters don't need our body or wealth or our minds. But they teach us that if in real life, on the spiritual path, we treat our body as if it belongs to the master. And don't abuse it like we do when, it's, when we think it's our own. If we treat our wealth, it belongs to the master, use it wisely. If we use our mind, it belongs to the master and we use it wisely. We are truly on the spiritual path. This was the instruction that King Janak got from Ashtabhaka. It's a great lesson. The surrender is, is in the mind. The surrender of the body means that you are recognizing that the body is going to function under the direction of your master. Wealth, you will use your wealth as if it belongs to the master. He's given it to you for use. Your mind, you will think as needed. Think on the lines as needed, as given instructions. And finally, the fourth surrender, he added one more. He was a modern version of Ashtabhakar now. Great master said, Surrender of the body, surrender of the wealth, surrender of the mind, and surrender of the surrenderer, the one who is surrendering, that's the ego. The surrender of the ego is the most difficult. Because even after you surrender these three, say, I have surrendered, I have done this, I have meditated. Did you know there is no greater obstacle to spiritual growth than the I that comes in? Like, I have done this, I have done this. Then it becomes a barrier itself to any spiritual growth. Therefore, even I has to be given up. How do we give up I? It's, it's a very difficult question and a very difficult answer. How do you give up I? Answer is that replace the I with the master. I don't do anything, master does it. At all times to be conscious of this is the master doing everything. Replaces the I. And then you are truly on the spiritual path and see how quickly the same routine meditation begins to become a magical meditation. It's such a simple transformation that takes place. This great master whose stories are unlimited stories that one could tell. And during the course of the day, course of the next two days, when we are sitting informally at lunch table or when, when you are watching me do some card tricks. Anybody interested in card tricks also? <laughs> Oh, there are plenty of people interested in that. Okay, we'll do that too. Because according to the mass, great master, when we are in this world, we live at the level of this world. We have not come to suffer. Buddha thought that suffering was essential for salvation, for nirvana. Buddha thought that life is suffering. And suffering is coming from desire and attachment. Which is true. Suffering in this world is coming from desire and attachment. But it does not mean the main purpose of life is to suffer. The main purpose of life is to know who you are, to know how you came here, 
to know this is not your home, this is not your place, you are visitors here. You are visiting for fun. People forget that part. They think we have come here to suffer. Of course you are suffering because you forget that you came here from fun. You think you belong here. You think you are the mind. You belong here. Just change these two things. You are not the mind. You have been given a mind to use. And this is not your place. You have come here to have fun. So I, I introduced this and some people thought that I must be deviating from the spiritual path to go into card tricks and to go into game plays and all that. I told them I one lesson I learned from great master was the whole thing is a big game. The whole life is a big game. Even our coming into this level is a big game. Even the creator is playing a big game with the whole creation. It's all a game. Anyway, what's the harm in having a small game of our own in it? So therefore, we, we, we take things lightly. I know the spiritual path is a very serious path because if you don't have the spiritual path, it's almost like living in hell. It's so bad out here. People, people are so unhappy. I have traveled around the world. Just like not, not go to one country and back. Actually going around like this. Across the rest of it. Atlantic. And then the other way around. I had to go two ways because I found I was unwinding and winding myself. <laughs> By crossing the date line. Every time I crossed the date line one way, I either gained the day or lost a day. So just to have equilibrium of my calendar. I went on one way, then I went the other way. Must have gone 65, 70 times already. But having gone all over, all over the world, people who ought to be having fun and joy out of the opportunity of experience through sensory perceptions, through a physical body, through a mind and spirit, all the equipment given to have fun in experience around you are all unhappy. What is making them so sad and unhappy? Depressed. Totally depressed. Why? Troubled by something that is so artificial, like the law of karma. Troubled by such a thing, like relationships. Trying to find happiness outside of themselves. Trying to find reality outside of themselves. Running to pilgrimages. Running to workshops. Running here and there to find truth. And all the time the truth is being carried by them inside. There is a, a kind of deer called busk deer. You have it in India, maybe some other places. A musk deer has the scent of musk. In it. it comes from inside, but the deer doesn't know it. The deer runs all over the garden, all over the park, all over the forest, looking for where is the smell coming from, where is the scent coming from. Ultimately, gets so tired and blocks its head against things, little realizing that the musk was sitting inside it. We are like the deer, We're running around all over to find something. That's within ourselves. We are going to places of worship outside thinking they must contain God, they must contain the reality and creator. When the creator is sitting inside us, there is no greater temple, no greater church than this body itself. This head placed on the top of our body is the only real place to worship, the only real place to realize, the only real place to have knowledge, true knowledge that Ashtabhakar could give. We carrying this head with us on our body. We run all around to find the truth. The truth is lying right inside. This is the only place where you should enter and do meditation. People tell me we, we have a nice place in our home. Yeshwar, come, I'll show you. Nice place is set up for meditation. Say, Let me see. They show me nice place. A chair, a special chair. Bought a very expensive cushion from Kashmir. They put it on the cushion for meditation. And I said, let me sit on it also. I want to meditate with this special meditation chair and the special cushion. So I sat there. I said, I am so happy to meditate. All my thoughts are on the chair and the cushion. <laughs> when will I find the truth? When we are decorating something outside and meditating upon it, how can we find the truth which is lying inside us? The only place where you can meditate successfully and get results is to sit in this house which is your own body. Sit in the sixth floor behind the eyes. There is a nice chamber and this is the whole body sitting vertically up like this when you sit upright in this body. This becomes like a real house, a mansion in which 
your soul lives, your mind lives, your creator lives, Satpurush lives, all the regions of the world live, this whole creation lives, every level of creation lives, it's all in this one body. All can be found in this one body which is the best place. And this body has so many levels created by energy chakras. And people are so enamored by the chakras. And we are now meditating on the six chakras. The six chakras were supposed to house only agents to help us survive. These six chakras. Some of the yogis say that the gods live there. Surely gods live there. They say right at the bottom, Ganesh lives there. The god of wish fulfillment. In the intestines and in the navel, Vishnu lives there. The god of sustenance. In the heart, Shiva lives there. Heart fails, you die. The god of death lives there. In the throat lives the most powerful god, not a god, a goddess. The goddess sits on top of the gods. And she is Shakti, power. And she sits in the throat. And then behind the eyes, who is sitting behind the eyes? You are sitting behind the eyes. All these gods and goddesses they have made are sitting in the chakras, in the energy centers below, so that the body can function well, the energies can travel around well and control, give you the power in this physical body to meditate, to be aware, to find out who you are, to find out what is inside you. This is all power given to you to work yourself and you are already in the wakeful state sitting in the sixth plane based on the number of chakras. You don't have to go down to the bottom of the basement to come up. You are already on the sixth floor. Great master used to say you don't have to do any yoga that takes you down below and then brings you up to realize who you are. You are already here. The physical wakeful state is a beautiful state. It's a state in which you are already behind the eyes. If you want to know where you are, you close your eyes and figure out if you are consciousness, if you are a source of awareness, if you are a focal point of awareness, where are you? You can close your eyes and look in the body and see. You are not in the hands, you are not in the limbs, you are not in anywhere below. You are in the wakeful state right behind the eyes. You open your eyes and you see outside in the world from here. You think, you talk, you do everything in this world from behind the eyes. That's your natural focal point of wakeful existence. Of course, when you're dreaming and sleep, you're not there. When you sleep, this very focal point drops down and goes down. When you're dreaming, you're really here. These yogis who have been able to keep half their awareness of the body alive, even when they go into a dream state, they have found that if they want to touch their eyes, their physical eyes, during their yogic practice, when they are in a dream state, they want to touch their eyes, they touch their throat. I think they are touching their eyes. You can do that too. Tonight you can try it out. That while you are awake, you can close your eyes, you know where the eyes are, your hands can rise up and say, these are my eyes. I know where the eyes are. I know the location of my eyes. And when you are half asleep, not fully asleep, just slightly asleep, try to touch your eyes. You want to touch your eyes, you touch your nose. You can try tonight. The focal point of consciousness only in the wakeful state is behind the eyes. In the dream state it drops. Dream state goes here in the throat and in very deep sleep when you have no remember dreams, it goes further down. And the yogis practice various kinds of yogas to take it further down. I have done that too. For eight years I was a rebel to the spiritual path and tried all the other kinds of yoga. Every kind that I could find. So I know this whole process that goes on. We don't have to do that. We are already here. We, when you are in a higher state of consciousness, in meditation you concentrate your attention. Behind the eyes, the focal point of where you are begins to shift from the eyeballs behind and goes further backwards and to the center. And then, when you are in the astral or physical astral experiences, you are somewhere in the middle. And then, the focal point rises in the middle of the head when you have higher experiences of the causal and parabrahm regions. It's all in the body. It's all happening in different parts of the body. You don't die. Your soul doesn't leave the body. The entire experience of 
of life after death can be attained right now. You can see exactly what happens when the body dies while the body is still alive. By just experiencing this. In fact, the correct way to describe good meditation is to describe it as dying while living. Dying while living is a good description. Because when you actually die physically, if you see people who are dying and they are dying slowly enough for you to observe them, you will see the first thing that happens to them is they forget where their hands and feet are. They don't know. They say, put my feet on this side. They are already this side. They start talking like this. They are unaware. The awareness escapes their limbs, extremities first and goes on to the torso. And the bottom of the torso, when they, they are still talking to us, dying while dying. When that goes up, they feel they are flying up in the air. They are not flying anywhere. They are just having lost the awareness of the bottom and goes up. When the heart fails, they are almost dead. When the brain dies, they are dead. They are no longer connected with this body. The process of dying is that the awareness is pulled out from the extremities of this body all the way right into the head and then you die. Meditation is exactly the same process that you concentrate your attention to such an extent behind the eyes that you forget where your hands and feet are. You become unaware of them. Gradually you become unaware of your limbs and your legs. You become unaware of your torso. It goes exactly in the same order. And you become unaware. And then the whole new world opens up for you. Which is not this body and not this world. The same process. Dying while living. And people read in the Bible. Paul saying I die daily. I don't know what they understand from it. But that's what he meant obviously. But there's a good story. That uh, great master used to tell. About uh, the dying while living. There used to be a. A merchant, merchant, a businessman in India who used to go to Africa every year. He did what is called import and export business. He used to carry some silks and some other garments from India and go and sell them in Africa. In Africa, he would buy cashew nuts and some other local fruits from there and bring them back to India. He would go once a year, he would trade there. On one of his visits, he visited one of the jungles forest in Africa and there he found a lot of parrots, beautiful birds. He said, these are such beautiful birds, I should take one with me to India. So he grabbed one of those <laughs> parrots and put him in a cage and brought him back to India. The bird was fed nicely, he fed the bird with chilies, red chilies, the birds love them, you know, and he fed them with churi, churi's flour mixed with and molasses and sugar and made into a nice candy like thing which the parrots liked. So he fed them and the parrot was nice and happy and he danced and he was always enjoying himself. Next year when he was about to leave for Africa he asked the parrot in the cage, I am going back to your country. Do you have any message to send to the people folks back home? And the parrot said sure. Tell them I am having a great time and dancing and singing and joining in this cage of mine and I eat my churi and I eat my chili and I am very happy. <coughs> so he went to Africa and the, after his business was over he went to the forest and gathered all the parrots. He says, all of you come gather here. I have a message for you. You remember last year I took a parrot from here. He sent you a message. He says he is enjoying his life in the cage there eating churi and he's eating chilies and he's dancing and singing and he's very happy. On hearing this, one older parrot sitting on the branch of a tree had tears in his eyes. And he looked at the parrot, the parrot fell down dead. He said, oh my God, this parrot must have been a very close dear friend of my parrot that he could not bear to hear his message. And he gave up his life, he died. Anyway, feeling sorry, he returned home. And he told the parrot in the cage, you know, I conveyed your message to the parrots in the jungle, but one of the parrots was so touched by the message. When I told him that you are in your cage enjoying your jury and all that stuff, he had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. When he said this, the parrot in the cage had tears in his eyes. 
and he fell down dead. A rogue, foolish merchant. If you knew they are so close to each other, one lost his life, and you now cause the death of the other one also. He opened the cage and threw the dead bird out and said, I'm very sorry about it. When he did that, the dead bird flapped its wings and flew up and sat on top of the wall. He said, you aren't dead after all? He says, no, I am not dead, nor is that other parrot dead. He just sent me a message through you. He sent me a message, if you want to get out of the cage, die while living. <laughs> it's, a, it's, an old, it's an old parrot story, you know. At one time I used to love these parrot stories. In 60, in 62, 63 I was here studying at Harvard and some people, uh, some people heard my parrot stories. They love the parrot stories, especially I was in a good job. I was the chairman of a corporation in India. And on a New Year's Day, somebody told me the story. Story of a, a parrot story. You would like to hear the story. This is called comic relief after serious discourse. <laughs> a man went to buy a parrot in a pet shop. And he saw many parrots. And he said, how much is this? It's $40, $50. Three big birds, big parakeets with beautiful plumage, nice color, colorful feathers, were sitting on top. There were three of them sitting on top of the shelf. He said, what about those three? He said, no, no, you can't afford them. They're very expensive. Forget about them. He said, but still, let me know what's so special about them. He said, the first one is $10,000. What? $50 and $10,000? What is so special about that parrot? So the special thing is, this parrot can speak in seven languages. Wow, that's great. So the second parrot is $15,000. What is so special about that one? This one can speak in seven languages and also sing in seven languages. So, wow, that's great. The third one was a very ugly looking parrot. A brown colored and no, no, not beautiful at all. He said, what about this third one? He said, that $25,000. So what's so special about him? He said, I don't know what is special about him. The dealer said, all I know is the other two keep on calling him Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> but when I told these parrot stories, a friend of mine who worked for Bell Telephone Company in Boston, he said, I'll take you to the right place that belo you belong to. It's in Florida. It's called the Parrot Jungle. I said, okay. So he drove down to Florida to the parrot jungle. And there, the sunken garden and there are parrots sitting all over. And uh, all of them have been trained to do various things. One was trying to ride a cycle and another was trying to speak and they were all saying, what's your name, what's your name? <laughs> Wacky voice, parrot voice. Uh, now I, we were five or six satsangis traveling together in that party. And I was walking a little faster than the others. I didn't use a cane in those days. I was walking a little ahead of the others. And I saw the parrots and one parrot sitting on the branch of a tree just looked up at me and said, what's the hurry? <laughs> not in a parrot voice, not in a squawky voice, but in a human voice. I stopped there and the parrot said, what's the hurry? I said, no hurry. <laughs> and I laughed that the parrot can say this. The parrot began to laugh too. That's the only laughing parrot I have ever come across. He not only laughed, he laughed with his head like this. Ah, ah. I was also laughing. By that time, the rest of the group, the Vista, said they saw the parrot and I laughing together. So they said, Ishwar, you must have been a parrot in a past life. <laughs> and I told them, very literally, I said, why in the past life, even in this life? I am just a parrot who repeats what the great master says. So I am like a parrot even today. So then they took it so seriously. For Christmas that year they sent me a live parrot in a cage. And they said, here is one of your relatives to keep you company. <laughs> this was carrying the parrot story too far. But that is how the parrots became such an important part of my life that the uh, that what is parrot talk? I mean, parrots only speak what you teach them to do. 
there is another bird we have in india called maina the maina bird speaks much more like a human voice and trained to be a speaker of human voices but if you if a man tries to teach the maina see these words unlike a parrot the maina will not repeat the parrot learns to repeat what you say and then keeps on repeating afterwards but the maina does not repeat so the art of training a maina is that a mirror is placed in front of the maina that bird and the instructor sits behind the mirror and the maina is seeing another maina in the mirror and therefore the instructor speaks from behind and the maina thinks it's a maina speaking and therefore the maina begin to repeat and learn the lesson do you know this is the story of a perfect living master sitting behind the mirror we don't want to listen to a, a creator sitting in consciousness in our head or to listen to somebody like us a man therefore the master sit behind the mirror of our own consciousness becomes a man we sing a man like ourselves and he speaks his language and we repeat and learn what he say we are no different than the minas learning to a mirror this story is also been told by the great master he said that is how the masters disguise themselves they disguise themselves so that we can be taught in the real form we can't recognize them there's no way you know disguise what is do you understand disguise to put on some other mask or something or become look different than you are <coughs> that's called a disguise in india there are some entertainers who disguise themselves you know have you heard the story of the entertainers who disguise themselves what do they call them barupia barupia actually literally the word barupia means a person who changes form changes these barupias or those who disguise themselves are entertainers and they disguise themselves in a different form than they are they come to your house and if you can recognize this is just an entertainer then you give him 5 bucks for entertaining you with this guys if you were mistaken you take that this guys to be real then you pay 50 bucks so in our house in ushapur i remember there used to be a entertainer like that who would come as dressed like a police officer i have a ticket to give you sir what did we do wrong oh you parked in the wrong place you violated this law okay how much is the ticket 50 bucks then you will realize he is paying because he is not a police officer at all he is disguised and sometimes they would disguise like swamis wearing ash on their bodies saying they are going to the himalayas and if you can guess no you are the same person we saw yesterday the police officer 5 bucks or really swami will give you some food to take on the way 50 bucks this is very that was a very common way of entertaining once i and my dad were going to see a doctor a doctor who lived in in the red light street you know the red light street is people know what red light street here is the prostitutes live and unfortunately the doctor's office was just on the other side we had to pass through that street so my dad and i were walking there and one of the women jumps out and catches me by the arm and says oh you are here again i said i don't know you i've never been here before my dad said no no you know young man you can make mistake no dad i've never seen this woman before she said of course i have seen you i saw you last week and there is no way you it's not possible and my dad kept on believing that woman and didn't believe me and i felt so embarrassed said, what am i going to do i went home i said dad this is not there is some misunderstanding i have never seen that woman i never gone there i don't believe in this stuff to go to prostitute that said look you and i are friends we are not only dad and son we are like friends you can tell me whatever it is i said telling you the truth <laughs> next day the swami comes and says give me 50 bucks i said no you are adjusted he said but not yesterday i wasn't <laughs> in the street i wasn't i had to give 50 bucks so that was not a prostitute that was a barupia now great master says these perfect living masters come and act like barupias they put on a disguise 
they disguise themselves to be like us. And sometimes they are fooled into believing that they are like us. Sometimes we fall in love with them and take full advantage of the fact that they are perfect living masters. The truth is, if a master were to come into this hall right now and show that he is not an ordinary human being, but flying around, suppose he comes flying around here, you know, it will be a very strange sight. A master coming flying in here, and we are all watching like this. Many of us will say, there must be a trick. Is there a rope attached or something? And some of us who see there is no trick might faint. Some ladies might faint just to see this. And then flying up here. None of us will ever feel a feeling of love and devotion for that man. If he falls down, many of us will rush and say, have you heard? Some love and devotion can come. Do you realize? That is the reason why these perfect living masters have not come to show magic in the streets. They have come to be ordinary human beings who can be loved like ordinary human beings. Who can, where we can experience the love and devotion that we only experience with human beings. Everything else is attachment. People say, I love my kids, I love my house, I love my car. This, this word love being used for attachment. These are all attachments. We call attachments and love. What's the distinction between love and attachment? What is the distinction? Simple. In attachment, you are always conscious of yourself as the object of your love or attachment. I love you. Cannot be love. I is more prominent in your consciousness than you. It's an ego game. But when you forget who I is and identify with the beloved, that's love. In love, in the space, in your mind, in your thinking space, I takes a back seat. The ego goes back. The beloved fills up the space. And you think of nothing but the beloved. I once said long ago in some meeting here that a lover does not say I love you. A lover says you, you, you. And so many people sent me cups, you know, to have coffee. On that was you, you, you. So this is a very, very beautiful way to put all the teaching into a cup. So I read you, you, you. And it doesn't make sense to me. Because where is the beloved? Without the beloved, you means nothing. So then you realize that when you identify, you forget who you are. True love is the only experience I know which puts the ego on the back seat. Otherwise, everything we do in this world, the ego comes up in front. I have done this. I am going to do this. Even meditation. I am going to do real meditation. I am going to meditate two and a half hours. I have never done that before. I am going to meditate eight hours. I am going to break the, break the record. How will that meditation succeed when I is so powerful? The ego is coming in the way. Ego, remember ego, I this, the I, is a separation. The I always separates you from the universe, from the totality, from your own master separates you. The more I you have, the more separate you are. So the ego is, a, is an instrument of separation. It's not an instrument of joining. So when you forget the I and you think of the beloved, think of we together, it means something. I sometimes say even togetherness is not pure love. Togetherness is also could be an attachment. Oneness, you find no difference. That is true love. And that you really have with a perfect living master. I can tell you that from experience. Great master, he was an embodiment of that. He lived such a simple, ordinary life. There was a great disciple of his. I'll end with the story of a beautiful disciple, his Bandara celebration. His name was Dr. Isher Singh. Isher Singh was a veterinary doctor. And he wanted to get initiated from a perfect living master. His neighbors were two Muslim guys who were disciples of great master. They told him, you want Murshid e Kamal, you want the perfect master, forget about religion, forget about your Sikh religion, any religion. He sits on the bank of the river three miles down from the road. Isha Singh said, I'll go and meet him. Isha Singh took his bicycle and he went around the bank of the river, three miles fast, four miles fast, no master, no hut, no dera. 
So he went eight or nine miles and he said, where is the master gone? So he asked a man who was rowing a ferry boat, where is the master? He's supposed to be three miles. He said, he's on the other side of the river. You are coming on the wrong bank of the river. He said, will you carry me to the other side? I have to meet the master tonight. He says, no, it's too late. Moreover, there is no footpath on the other side. There's just a small village where it's ferry people across. Doesn't matter, just take me. He says, there's no proper road. They're all thorns and there's a forest. Doesn't matter. He says, so he took the ferry and crossed over. He carried his bike on his head. On his head. There was no pathway to take the bike even. And he reached early morning. And there was a little hut where the great master used to come at that time. He was in service. He used to come only on weekends for satsang. So he reached there early morning and he knocked at the door and a woman who, whose name he had heard, her name was Bibi Rukko. Rukko who had worked with Swamiji who had come from Deir Agra and had accompanied Baba Jamal Singh and was still staying there when great master became the master. And she came out and used such abusive language. You guys have no respect for a man. Early morning you want to come and disturb the master. Go away. And she used all the F words, every kind of word in Punjabi. <laughs> he was shocked. This woman who's supposed to have only three masters is so angry. If she got nothing, what am I going to get from this master? He is no master at all. So he went back and told the neighbors, you sent me to the wrong place. I saw a woman who was so angry, used such foul language. And if she has spent time with three masters, and this is what she has got, what am I going to get there? And those neighbors laughed at him. He said, see, the master played a trick on you. He said, what kind of trick is this? Is there no trick? Yeah. Did you go to see the master? Did you go to see the woman? I went to see the master. But you didn't see the master. You came after seeing the woman. That's how master judge your intensity of seeking. You were not a seeker of the master. You would have crossed any border and gone to see the master. You stopped short. And the woman will never be like that when you see her again. That was just a face put up to test how deep your seeking is. He said, I'll go again then. So he went again in the daytime. Found a place where the master was. The master was sitting outside. He said, Master, I came at night and I was rebuked by that lady. The lady was so kind and of course. And uh, I want to get initiated. I heard so much from my neighbors about your spiritual teaching. Master said, have you broken your arm? I said, what? Is that a requirement for initiation? To break your arm? He said, no, it's not a requirement. It just happens that your time for initiation will come after you've broken your arm and repaired it and healed it. Then come to me. And I'll initiate you. He said, Master, but why would I break my arm? You know, aren't you a veterinary doctor? Don't you ride on horses? Yes, Master. You can fall from a horse and break your arm. Said, why would I fall from a horse? Well, it happens. Accidents happen. He was convinced there is something going on here. He said, Master, I'll see you later. And he came home. Now, he was a veterinary doctor, animal doctor for the Maharaja of Kapoorthala. The prince who ruled over the territory and he used to treat their horses and so on. As soon as he reached home, his wife Maya said, where have you been all day? His majesty, the king has been calling you all day to come to the palace and he must be having some problem. He's called several messages he has sent. So he ran to the palace. He said, I'm sorry. He said, where were you all day? I went to see a Maharaji. What Maharaji? I'm the only Maharaj. No, no, no. He's a holy person. We call him Maharaji. No, no, there's no Maharaji. You are a sensible man. Don't follow these gurus and all that. He said, why did you call me? He said, oh, you know, good news. Only this morning, two new horses have come. Beautiful Arab steeds. Come straight from Arabia. And I wanted to ride them. I said, no. Isha Singh and I will both ride together. So I'm waiting for you. He said, no, Majesty, I'm not going to ride a horse. <laughs> why you ride a horse every day? I don't want to fall and break my arm. Who has put this superstition in your head? You're such an excellent writer. No, ma no, Majesty, excuse me. 
Let me save my face. I've told the whole palace that Easter Singh will come and we'll inaugurate the two horses together. Okay, you don't want to ride? Just sit on this on the horse. I'll sit on one. I'll ride away. You can get off. So that's fine. So the king mounted his horse. Easter Singh put his uh, foot in the stirrup. And just as he sat on the horse, the horse fell out. <laughs> the unknown territory of the horse fell just outside and did multiple fractures of the arm the same night. <laughs> he said, that man surely knows what he is saying. This must be a master. You know, it's a, it's a difficult lesson for me, but I have to go back. So he plastered, got plastered, took 10 weeks, multiple fracture. And when he reached the master again, he said, master, you are right. I've broken my arm. Is he broke your right arm? Yes, I broke my right arm. Okay, raise your hand to your ear. The master, I can't do that. It's all calcification from the shoulder down. It's all, I can't take it higher than this. Oh, sorry, then I can't initiate you. <laughs> oh, you put new conditions on this every time? You didn't tell me this. He said, I didn't. I told you. <coughs> then your arm is broken and healed. Then come to me. It's not healed. He says, Master, this you can't heal. It's a calcification. He says, when your horses break their legs, what do you do? Either you shoot them or what do you do? He says, no, we have an acid in which we can dissolve. He said, why don't you use the acid? He says, Master, do you know how painful that is? That the horse that is using the acid hits on the ground, makes a hole in the ground. So painful. Do you want me to use that? He said, no, dilute it. What ratio do you use there? 1 to 4, make it 1 to 16. He said, okay, master, I'll come again. So he used that. He could put his ear and then only he got initiated. But he was such a happy person. He got so much. He was like a friend. He wanted his father to be initiated. And the father did not believe in any human gurus at all. He was sick. He believed that the Granth Sahib, the holy book, was the last guru. And we must believe in the book. And no one else can ever be a guru again. He tried to convince his father, at least go and meet the master once. He said, never in my life will I meet anybody you call a master. He said, what would I do? He went to the great master. He said, I want my father to be initiated. But he doesn't want to believe in you, doesn't want to come to you. He said, Isha Singh, bring your dad to me. That's your job. To initiate him is my job. He said, okay, master, I'll bring him. So one day, the master was going to travel by train to some town city. So Isha Singh said, Master, you'll be at the railroad station. This dad of mine will never come to the Dera, but I can bring him by trickery to the railway station. Will you give him darshan? Because if you see him, I know he'll get initiated. He said, yes, yes, bring him to the station. So the great master was walking up and down the platform of the railroad station. And Isha Singh told his dad, Dad, I have some work with the station master there. And will you come along with me? He said, come along, we'll go. They both took horses and they both went to the station. He said, Dad, hold my horse. I have a little work with the station master. And I'll go and I'll come back in a few minutes. He said, go ahead, son. He held the horse. Isha Singh ran down and saw the master. He said, master, 10 minutes more to the train. Will you come up and see my dad? Said, sure. So the master running like this. Think of the think of the beauty of that friendship. It's not a master sitting on a pedestal giving a discourse. It's the master running with his friend up the stairs on that platform. Yes, I didn't see him. And they're both running up. But the dad suspected there was something going on. He had left the sitting horse and gone away. He missed the bus. So Isha Singh said, Master, what can I do? He just doesn't want to see you even. He said, Isha Singh, you bring him to me. That's your job. I will initiate him. That's my job. The master doesn't know what a tough challenge he is accepting. But he accepted the challenge. And one day early morning, when his dad was sleeping. He took a long rope. You know, those beds are very simple cots. Just woven with something and simple bamboo cots. So he swung the rope around and tied his dad and picked up the whole bed with the dad and he ordered a horse carriage to come and be ready outside. 
is about 15 miles to Videra. And he tied up the dad. What are you doing? What are you doing? So I am taking you to the master. What a foolish man you are. You think by force you can take me there? I will never believe in your master. I don't believe in it. And don't be so cruel to your dad. He said, dad, this will not stop till I reach Videra. Master says, you bring your dad is your job. And initiation is his job. So he put him on the cart and he was shouting, look at my mad son, look at what he's doing. And all the neighbors came out. And he says, what's happening? He says, my, mad, my father's turned crazy, I'm taking him to hospital. And he said, I'm not crazy, my son is crazy. And the, and the neighbor said, take him quickly. <laughs> so there goes the carriage with the dad trying to push around and crying. And this strange scene is taking place, and master sitting there on a chair outside his hut, and a carriage, horse carriage is coming, car carrying a man tied up, <laughs> on dead, <laughs> howling away, <laughs> screaming away. And then when they reached, the master got up, he stood up, he said, what's this going on? Mr. Singh said, I have brought my dad. <laughs> you said, bring your dad, is your job, and now it's your job. He says, how can you be so foolish and crazy? The dad said, that's exactly what I've been telling you. <laughs> he says, take the gentleman off from the car. Put some balm on him. Look how he's injured himself, trying to get out of those ropes that were tied around him. He told his son, he's taken inside. Let's give him something. And they took the dad inside. And Mr. Singh said, this is a real tough nut to crack. He's not going to get initiated. Easy. So the great master comes out and says, you go away now. Come up three days. So Mr. Singh left. He said, three days? Three years won't be enough to handle my dad. So three days later, Mr. Singh comes in his horse. And he sees a strange sight. Great master still sitting on that chair. And his dad is standing in front of him like this. He said, this is, am I seeing the right thing? And as he gets off from his horse, his horse shits like this. Shits number two, whatever you call it. <laughs> and Isha Singh's dad takes off his shirt. He says, you are such a foolish, stupid son of mine. In the presence of a great master, you allowed the horse to create dirt over here. And he cleans up the dirt with his shirt. And Isha Singh is looking, are you my dad? Are you the same person? He used to call it Bapu. Are you Bapu? I, I can't believe. He says, you are such a stupid man. You never told me anything about this man. He is a perfect master. You know, I discovered only by coming here. And I am glad to tell you, only this morning he initiated me. Such stories of a, a, a great, great man who, who, Isha Singh stories are unbounded, so many. He invited great master. He said, master, come to my house. We always come to the Dera to see you. You never travel outside. He said, I never travel outside. Whoever has to come and talk to me, I do my seva for them. I am my master's servant. I do seva for people. And they all come here. He says, Master, you know, in Kapurthala, in my town, there is a very nice congregation of disciples who want to see you. And I will make all the arrangements. Now, he was a poor veterinary surgeon. He didn't have a big house, a small house with a roof and the little back area he had kept up upstairs. But there was a cow yard outside. I mean, there were some cows and some other, it was not so very clean. But he came back, he said, great master agreed to come to my house. Great master agreed to come. And he said, clean up all the sevalas. So the 40, 50 people all gathered cleaning up. Great master is going to come here. But there were two important guys in the same town. One was a judge. And he was a very important satsangi also, follower of the master. And the other was a professor. These two people had big mansions, houses in the same town. When they heard great master agreed to come to their town, they set up a committee to decide on the arrangements for great master's visit. And they said, we'll let the master decide which house to live in. And they prepared both the houses, the professor's house and the judge's house for master stay. But Isha Singh was cleaning up his house and master is going to come and stay with me. 
on the appointed day great master's car comes accompanied by shadi that gangster turned stories i'll tell you sometimes gangster turned saint and his uh, driver and when they came isha singh was standing with the other sevadars at the tur turning point where his house was on one lane small lane and the master's car with those two big guys sitting in it went straight ahead they didn't stop at the lane because they took the master to their houses that he won't stay with these same poor house he they won't be in the big mansion they had prepared so he, they stopped at the house of the judge and, and all the family of the judge came and bowed to the master touched his feet and uh, the judge said master we prepared a guest room for you to stay here uh, shall we take your bags out he said no need the bags in the car they got a hint and so maybe he's going to stay with the professor so then they took the car to the professor's house meantime all the uh, sangat and the sevadars who had been collected by isha singh at his house said isha singh you are so foolish to think that the master will stay at your house those two big wigs have taken him away and there he'll stay there and what are you wasting your time cleaning up this place and making us waste our time he's going to give darshan in that big lawn outside there let's at least go and have his darshan this we're waiting here for master to come they ran away they went to the place where they have the view of the master the darshan and then even his wife his name was maya she said you all i have been married to a fool all my life and you don't realize the master will never come here she also went he said go away you all go away and he he said saying locked himself up in his house and he cried and he said master what kind of friend are you you promise that you will come to my place and then these uh, rich people these big influential people they take you in their car and they are putting you up there the whole sangat who worked so hard for 3 days cleaning up the place has run away also nobody is here i have been left alone here are you that kind of a friend of mine and this is what isha singh did the masters reached the professor's place they said we have arranged a room for you he says leave the bags in the master these are the only two appropriate places for you he said the poor fellow isha singh is waiting for him he says master he has no proper place at all to stay he has no guest room he has not even a proper toilet and bathroom for him he says if he lives there master says if he lives there how does he go to the toilet is this he just goes out to the forest or somewhere and he just has a bath with a bucket of water and he pours it on his head he says for two days i can also do that great master says turn the car i want to go back they they get disappointed but master says go back you have to go back they go back and the car turns into isha singh's lane and he says stop the car here i'll walk the rest of the distance he leaves the secretary and she and everybody behind in the car and he walks alone knocks at the door isha singh thinks some other satsangi has come to call him he says go away you all go away isha singh this is me shravan singh and he hears the master's voice he open the door the master walks in and locks the door back again and hugs him and says you think i will not come here i will stay here with you satsang will be held outside in this place and everybody will come here and the master stayed three days there proving what friendship can mean with a master he doesn't care how high or low your status is in life the only thing that he really respects is your love and devotion that's what matters most your love and devotion for the master and that was the story of fisher singh when i think of the beauty of his relationship i came to harvard and there was a satsangi friend of mine roy kor he was living in connecticut and i told him the story of isha singh he said come to india show me that man the master is gone he died long ago in 1948 the master passed away i said i can't show you great master i can show you his great disciple we went to kapurthala to this place and i introduced roy kor to isha singh so this is the man i tell you stories about and isha singh said this man is from america he says yes he's a very dear sincere satsang a disciple he said i will show him something that he may not have seen before so he took him to his bedroom 
and opened his Almira, and in that were great master's shoes. He said, these are great master's shoes he gave them to me. And Roy Cole was so impressed that this man was holding his shoes up on the shelf there. He went and touched those shoes, he put his head on the shoes, and he felt that he had been blessed by great master. He felt very happy. He should sing a tear in his eyes. He said, this man coming from a far off land is paying respect to the shoes of my master. What can I, how can I honor him? So when Ishar Singh had retired, the king of the state, who used to wear a gold embroidered crown for festival occasions, all embroidery was in real gold thread, a big beautiful gold gown the king used to wear, he gave him as a retirement gift to Ishar Singh. Ishar Singh went and took that out, said, Roy Kaur, take this, just for showing respect to my master's shoes. Mm. Roy Kaur put them on. He said, I look like a king. I said, indeed you are. A king who can show respect to a master, who has love and devotion for his master, is no short of a king. I would rather bow before a person who is a king in that form of a true disciple of a master than a king who sits on a throne. There are too many kings who sit on a throne today at the throne off the other day. But a true disciple of a master can never be thrown off from the throne. Such is the beauty of this path. The path is the master. The teachings you can get anywhere. Teachings are available in all the books, a thousand, maybe millions of books today on spiritual teachings. In every library you can go and find them. If you could read the books and learn spirituality, we would all have been enlightened by now. The books describe things that the mystics have experienced. If you read a book about the beauty of the Waikiki beach in Hawaii and read it every day, say, I'm going to read it every day. You won't be in Waikiki at all. You can't go to Hawaii by reading a book. You have to buy a plane ticket, fly there and do what the book says. Then when you see Hawaii, you'll say the book was right. That's the only way the book will make sense to you. Same thing is true of all the scriptures of the world. They describe the events and experiences that you can have on the spiritual path. They are not experiences. Reading, more reading, more reading never takes you where they're telling you to go. By practicing what they say, you can reach there. Then you will read the book again and say, that's exactly what the book was saying. I never understood it before. So this teaching is such a practical thing. Great Master said, this is not a theoretical path at all. Do not have any blind faith in any path. He said, do not even believe a master unless you experience yourself. It's based entirely on your personal experience. And you must have personal experience to be able to say, yes, I believe this path is right. It's all based on personal experience and no blind faith at all. So I come here today, 2nd of April, to give tribute to my master, to remember him. Of course, every day should be a bandara, every day we should remember. But we also made bandara a kind of a festival because we produced a lot of food that day. Food to be known. Eventually, the food became more important than the master. <laughs> and people said it was great bandara because there was great food. I came to this country. And first time I spoke in this country was on the 2nd of April, 1963 in Chicago, Bandara Day. And I spoke there and except for a few people who remembered what I said, all others said, great Bandara, the best food they have ever tasted. <laughs> so we can convert the abundance of grace into abundance of food. But let both be there. So what? Now it's time for you to have the abundance of food. I must have tired you out with the abundance of stories. But I tell you, the abundance of grace that's available to you, keep your attention, the cup of attention, up like this today. Some people say, if grace is really flowing, why don't I get it? Well, you don't get it because even if it rains heavily, and you put the cup upside down, 
never tells up. Even if it's a torrent of rain, the cup is down, it never tells up. If you turn the cup upside, straight up, fills up in the very first shower. The cup of attention that needs to be like this is what matters most today. When your attention is not scattered with anything else of the world, but only on receiving the grace today, you see how quickly they get filled up right today. But if your cup is upside down and you're remembering what things you've left behind, what you have to do next week, and what problems are still to be solved there, the cup is like that. You go back empty and say, ah, that was just a joke. There's a great bandara. Where was the bandara? Bandara is dependent on what you receive, and that's all based on the direction of your cup. Some people argue with me. You know, we have to live in this world. You know, you may be you may be crazy that you think that the spiritual path is all that you have to do. This is the United States of America. We have to pay our bills, we have to work, we have to take care of our things, take care of our families, take care of everything else. We are surrounded by work. So we have to divide our attention between work and meditation and the spiritual path. You know, the position of the cup, when you divide it, the cup lies flat like this. If it's totally in the world, it's like this. If it, and, and the spiritual grace is up. When it's divided like this, it's like this. I don't think a cup that lies sideways like this ever gets filled up. It seems to get a few drops and they fall out. Let at least one day be different from the others. Let one day be devoted to receiving the grace of the Lord. And when I say great master, I am referring to my master because he sits in me and his my relationship. It does not mean that you also start worshipping the great master. You worship your own master. Because we are talking of a perfect living master. We are not talking of a dead master. We are not talking of a master who lived long ago. We want to think of a master and put our attention to the grace of a master who is inside us, who has initiated us, who we believe in. And he will give you the grace today. So while I enjoy, I am rejoicing and celebrating the great master, it is an opportunity for you just to take the cue and not that you blindly follow a master who died in 1948. You follow a master who was alive, who held your hand and said, I accept you. There was a great mystic named Farid, Sheikh Farid and his son. And Sheikh Farid was not yet, not yet a master. He, Kutbuddin was his master. So he told his son, son, I have been initiated by Kutbuddin. It's a great opportunity. Go and get initiated. Son said, you know, dad, I'm still young. You know, I have to live my world. You are old and you old retired people can go and do meditation. This stuff not for me. Wait till I grow up. He said, son, don't lose the opportunity. This opportunity only comes when a perfect living master whose consciousness is transcended while he is in the body and comes in contact with you. That's the time when you get initiated. <coughs> and the son said, I can wait. Then one day Kutbuddin died. And Farid was at the burial ground and the, and the body was being lowered. The son ran. He shaved off his head and he put his head on the feet of the body of Kutbuddin and said, Master, forgive me. I didn't come early. And his dad said, but he said, son, the man whose body you have, we are lowering in this grave and on the feet of whose body you have laid your head, I have the greatest respect and love for that man. But I am sorry you are too late. He can give you nothing. While he was alive, he could give you everything. You have to have a living master who can be a living friend of yours while he is alive. He says, only a sheikh who can hold your hand and say, speak with his words, I accept you, can grant initiation to you, not one who has died already. Anyway, Farid became master and eventually initiated his son. But the story is very clear. You may have the greatest respect for dead masters, but dead masters 
will not initiate it. What's the difference? Dead master, whether he died yesterday or he died 2000 years ago, died 10,000 years ago, has done his job and gone in the physical body. He came to pick up his mark sheet while he was in the physical body. He had his own list of mark sheet. He's gone. Masters are there all in every age to respond to the seekers. You don't find a master, the master finds you. If you are a true seeker and you seek in your heart, never speaking a word, the master will find you. How will he find you? A coincidence. <coughs> Look how many of you have run through masters, perfectly we master through coincidence alone. It's all coincidence. The masters arrange things. They play the game of coincidence and pick up the souls that are marked to be taken. Don't forget, it has been said many are called, but few are chosen. It's not the Bible, but it applies to all the masters. When masters come into this world in the physical body, they come for us. <laughs> Each master has his list of marked sheep, like they call this, marked souls who they come to take back home. And those disciples of theirs will go back home with that master. There are many others who are called and they even can be seen can be seen by a master, can hear a master, even get initiated by a master, but have not yet fulfilled their karmic load here, and they find another master, possible in the second life, third life, up to fourth life. So only the last master is the master in whose list you figure as the chosen one. And that's the one who takes you back to back home. People sometimes ask. Is it necessary to have four lives? They hear about in the books, four lives. Swamiji wrote in one of his poems, people sing that. Ek jaram gur bhakti, jaram dusre naam. I'm speaking in Hindi language. I'll translate for you, just for my own memory. Ek jaram gur bhakti, dusre jaram naam, tisre jaram turiya pad chauthe me nijdam. He says, don't think the spiritual path is an easy way that in a few months you can go to such country to go to your true home. The normal time schedule is this. In the first, you find a master and learn the art of love and devotion. In the second life, you get initiated. Third life, you reach the top of the world of the mind, which is Turiyapa, which is Brahm, end of Brahm, causal stage. In the fourth, you reach home. It's just a quote from that book. But it does not mean that you have to have four lives. In fact, my dad had an experience. He was also, he was actually the first initiate. I was, uh, I, I almost got into this path by accident of birth. But my dad, he was a student of philosophy and the philosophers, his teachers could not answer his question on metaphysics, which great master answered. So he he's a greater professor. He's a professor of metaphysics, so he became initiated. But one day he went to the great master and he said, Master, I hear you told in the uh, discourse today that a initiate of any perfect living master will not have more than four lives of incarnation again. Is that true? And great master said, Lake Raj, that was his name. Lake Raj, why are you worried? This is your last life. You don't have to worry about four lives. He says, Master, I was not worried about the last life or four lives. I wanted if I need more than four. What about if you happen to decide to come again and again? Surely I don't want to stay back in such a I'd like to be where you are. So that's why I asked. Then the great master explained, a person who is initiated by a perfect living master and does with love and devotion, the meditational techniques the master teaches him. This is a last life. If he has to make up any part of the spiritual journey, he'll make that disciple do it in the higher stages of consciousness. He doesn't have to be reborn here. He may take some time inside, depending on the load of karma and so on. But if you don't follow the instructions rigidly and fail in following the regimen that the master sets for you, then you may have a second life. 
But if you leave the path and run away and say, no, no, it's not real, it's just a, it's a, it's a mind game. Crazy people have made up a story about such kind, made a story about meditation. Then you have to come and hurt him. But only if you go against the master and hate him and work against him, you come from the fourth life. So why are you worried about it? If you follow the master's teachings, this is your life. You don't have to wait for another life. That's how the great master answered. So some people, when I came here, people all thought we have to uh, be here for fourth, fourth life. And I would ask them, how do you know this is not your fourth life? Do you remember your past lives? Because very few people remember past lives. Very few people know what happened. But they carry memories, they carry things and they, they run into this. Their thoughts are like that from the beginning. So many people I have met here who at an advanced stage got initiated. But then they discovered that they were seekers from childhood. That these thoughts were coming to them from children. They had to run away from religion. They had to run away from rituals. Even as a child they couldn't accept it. Or they were being brought up like that. Then they were initiated, they found that their whole life was patterned to go end up with initiation and ultimately realization. So let us, I am thankful to you, all of you, for joining me in this bandana. You have done me a great honor that all of you present here, I am sure there is ample food, bandara of food also. And the great master's blessings are on you and to denote to you how strong the blessings are. You know, we do a little semi-astrophysical trick of giving you astral gifts on some of these occasions. How many of you are interested in getting them today? Okay, your day has come and if your cup is like this, you will get some good gifts. The gifts are not physical. But when you will see the gift, you will know where they come from. The gifts have been loaded up on top of the roof of this building. Now, your job is to go up on top of the roof. Since the gifts are not physical, you don't have to go up physically. You have to go up astrally. You have to go with your astral bodies. And people say, we never done meditation, we have no idea of astral body. Every one of you know what the astral body is. The astral body is no more then the body that can pick up sensory perceptions without physical matter. The astral body is, if I were to say, can you imagine that you can walk up to that corner in your imagination, you can see yourself walking up, you walk with your astral body. There is no other body. Let nobody confuse you that there is something else. Because with that body, you can feel you can walk, you can see the corner, you can touch it. If I were to tell you, Get up with your astral bodies and shake my hand. Let's see how many of you can do it. Right now. Let's see if you can, in your imagination, with your imaginary bodies, walk up without hitting anybody on the way. Walk up and shake my hand. Here it is. Try it. Thank you. How many did it? Very good. You all are acquainted with the astral body. Now you know how to go up on the roof. It's as simple as that. You have to use power of imagination. Imagination is not as imaginary as you think. It's only imaginary while you think this physical is the reality. When this physical is not reality, imaginary becomes real. It's just a conversion. If 50% of your attention, which is now in the physical body, were to move into the imaginary body, imaginary body immediately will become more real than this body. It's just a question of how much attention you have placed, scattered in this body. So now use your imaginary bodies, or your astral bodies, or your sensory bodies, or sublime bodies, and go on top of the roof. You can fly out, you can climb the wall, you can go by stairs, or follow any method by which you can reach the top. When you walk on top of this building, see if there is a package for you. If you find you have a package, you can open it up there or you can bring it down and open it. So close your eyes and walk with your imagination to the top of the building and see what gift you can get. Take your time. Take your time. No hurry. Now hurry up.
Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Welcome back here. Welcome back. How many of you are lucky enough to find the package of this? Very good, very good. The others will get a second chance on Sunday. <clears throat> if you are still here. Well, thank you very much for joining on this Bandara. Very grateful to you for coming and joining me.